DiscerningHearts.com presents The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. For over 20 years, Dr. Bunsen has been active in the area of Catholic social communications and education, including writing, editing, and teaching on a variety of topics related to church history, the papacy, the saints, and Catholic culture. He is the faculty chair at the Catholic Distance University, a senior fellow of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, and the author or co-author of over 50 books, including the Encyclopedia of Catholic History and the best-selling biographies of St. Damien of Molokai and St. Kateri Tekakowitha. He also serves as a senior editor for the National Catholic Register and is a senior contributor to EWTN News. The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Matthew, thank you so much for joining me again. A great privilege to be with you, Chris, especially about uh, such a remarkable doctor of the church. And, And that's saying something, given many of the people we've talked about. She is incredible in so many ways. Well, that's exactly right. In 1970, uh, Pope Paul VI did, declared her uh, among the first of the women doctors of the church. In fact, you can make the argument that she was the first uh, because uh, Catherine of Siena was named about a week later. So it's a statement of the importance that Paul assigned to her in the, the church, uh, but also the teachings that I think he wanted the church to be able to reflect on. Uh, in her life, in her writings, uh, her contributions uh, to our understanding of the mystical life, but also her understanding of prayer, not connected as it is to the mystical life. But we think of Teresa of Avila as one of the greatest mystics in the history of the church. So she's uh, accomplished something in her lifetime that's unattainable for us, when in fact, um, and I know that we'll be talking about this, Teresa of Avila makes it possible for all of us to understand what prayer is and how then to take that prayer life, and this is true for all of us, into the heights of mystical contemplation. So as we have talked about doctors of the church previously, we we can talk, for example, about Francis de Sales and, and others, always stressing the fact that holiness is for everyone that that life of prayer, that deep relationship that we can have with our Lord isn't for just a few, the elect, some elite group, but it is for all of us. And in that sense, then, Teresa of Avila, as the doctor of prayer, uh, is a very important figure in the history of the Church. Oh, tremendous blessing was given to the Church in that The life of St. Teresa of Avila was chronicled with her own hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the the life of uh, Teresa of Jesus, uh, her autobiography, written uh, to help her nuns, uh, as so many of these great books often start. I think of Therese of Lisieux, uh, for example, deeply honest in its self-appraisal. And in in that sense, uh, its value is that it is so frank and so honest. Uh, How does she begin her book? But she says, I had a father and mother who were devout and feared God. Our Lord also helped me, she wrote, with his grace. All this would have been enough to make me good if I had not been so wicked. Mm. That's That's her own self-appraisal. And she has wonderful insights into her family life. Uh, She notes, for example, that her father was very much given to the reading of good books. And so she said uh, he had them in Spanish that his children might read them. And right there in that just a little opening paragraph for her, we begin to appreciate um, her own spiritual development, her own intellectual development but also how valuable an autobiography like this can be. I'm reminded, of course, and there there are a number of parallels between uh, Teresa of Avila and Augustine. Now, Augustine uh, was sort of a world-class sinner uh, prior to uh, his magnificent uh, transformation, his incredible conversion. But Teresa of Avila considered herself also a, a horrible sinner in different ways. 
And in that sense, then, her autobiography is also a lesson in the style of the confessions, in that a soul is willing to bear itself for the betterment of others, to lay forth uh, the, the sins and failings that almost everyone else, all of us, would be so inclined to either gloss over or to omit certain pertinent details uh, about our own lives out of pride, out of shame, uh, out of a reluctance to have ourselves, our inner selves, exposed. And yet, Teresa of Avila discerned the importance of that honesty because she needed to be able to tell her audience of her journey. And in that sense, then, too, uh, her autobiography is not quite unique in that its frankness is so valuable, but it's unique in that we get to make this journey with her, uh, much as we did with Augustine. And she was born at, at such an incredible time when it comes to the dissemination of this material. This is the time when the printing press makes available books to the common man. I mean, so that you can have it in your home. So not only was she, you know, when she sat down to write this, you're right. I mean, she was writing it for her sisters. She never, I, I doubt, dreamt that it would one day be put into print and then disseminated into the hands of men and women throughout all of Europe and then eventually throughout the world. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Here we're seeing someone who put together her life for her sisters, which itself is the fruit of years of reflection and a spiritual journey. And I mean, it was written in uh, the, the Carmel uh, for her sisters, but at the same time, she had submitted her soul to what? The, the discernment of other people. In particular... Uh, the one who is simply called the Master, another doctor of the church, St. John of Avila. And what did she want to do? She wanted to stress the presence and actions of God's mercy in her life. And she was then able to build, when, when we were going to talk more about this in her own prayer life and her spiritual development, but we're seeing the, the relentless fruits of her years of experiences of contemplation and consultation and discernment with some of the great spiritual masters and saints of her age. She was born in, in what year? I mean, she was born in 1515, two years before the start of the Protestant Revolt. Mm -hmm. As she grew up, what was happening well, the, the, the great Catholic reform picked up speed, and she was one of those towering figures of the 16th century and became then a, a incredible beneficiary of the richness of the teachings that were gaining such strength in that time. I think, for example, one of the formative figures in, in her early prayer life, the Spanish Franciscan Francisco of Osuna, who wrote these beautiful books on spirituality that in the end shaped her. Then there's the, the meditations by St. Peter of Alcantara. Uh, we know as well the influence of Ignatius of Loyola. We know the influence of the Dominicans. So her autobiography uh, became a living testament to the strength and vitality of the church in the 16th century as a result of the Catholic reform, but also the strength and vitality of Catholic spirituality, uh, authentic spirituality, uh, that every step of the way helped to shape her. So she became, in a way, the distillation, the synthesis of the, the great spiritual reform that was accompanying the great institutional reform uh, through Trent and, and through the great reforming movements and the reforming popes and the, the Jesuits and, and others, all played out in the quiet drama of the life of one Carmelite nun in Spain. Mm. Let's talk about Spain. And that would have a profound influence on her life. Yes, of course. But, but because of the effect that it had on it, 
her ancestors. I mean, her immediate mm-hmm. family. I'm thinking of her grandparents. Yes. yes. Can you break that open for us, Matthew? Yeah, well, we know that her grandfather and her father's side, uh, Juan Sanchez de Toledo, uh, was a, a Jewish convert to Christianity, a, a Marano. And in at one point, we know that he was uh, investigated and probably condemned by the Spanish Inquisition uh, for uh, possibly abandoning the Christian faith after he had converted. Her father, then, Alonso Sanchez de Cepeda, uh, was eager to join into the, the Christian culture of the time, not for pure political reasons, but because I think he saw it as essential for the, the betterment of his family. Her mother, Beatriz de Ahumada, uh, was a deeply prayerful woman. And so it's interesting that in the life of these great saints in 16th century Spain, the, the movement of the Spanish Inquisition, and we could devote an entire series to that conversation, but the Spanish Inquisition was, it was a constant factor in the lives of so many of these saints. We think of John of the Cross, I think of John of Avila, who spent two years essentially under house arrest uh, by the Inquisition. What are we learning from this? What, what we see from this is that there, there was this internal tension in Spain at the time of how to deal with the, the Protestant revolt, but also the, the changing culture of Spain at the time. It's easy to forget that in, it was only in 1492 that the Spanish peninsula, that I, the Iberian peninsula, was united fully under the Christian banner uh, with the final defeat of the Moors. The result was a very difficult transition period uh, as the Moors declined, they ended their supremacy, especially in Andalusia, and it required great evangelization, but also great vigilance uh, in rebuilding what was supposed to be a unified Spanish culture. And so the the Inquisition, uh, sponsored and directed by the crown, it's always important to note, was hypervigilant. And the great saints of this era, all of them, in one form or another, had an encounter with the Inquisition. And Teresa of Avila was uh, no exception to this. And yet, each of these saints dealt with the Inquisition not by abandoning the church, in fact, by embracing uh, the church all the more because they knew they, that they could have trust in the church that the right thing would happen. And in each of these cases, it did. In the case of John of Avila, he was uh, given total exoneration. And in fact, his reputation was deep. And and as a consequence of his time with the Inquisition, he became one of the great living experts in the church on St. Paul. In the case of John of the Cross and in the case of Teresa of Avila, which we're going to talk more about, I know, the, the great reforming movement that they wanted to institute was not just validated, but was, as a consequence, encouraged when they were exonerated. So there's so much going on at this time, and a figure like Teresa of Avila, practical, earthy, as, as to use your phrase, uh, was ideally suited uh, for her time because she was so confident in herself, but not out of ego, but because she knew that she was doing the right thing. In looking at how she was able to embrace that. I think it really helps us to take a look at her life within her own family before she left the order. She had a great love for her father, didn't she? She did. Um, And she writes about the fact that she was fascinated from an early age with the lives of the saints. And so much that she wanted to be a martyr for for the faith and actually ran away with her brother Rodrigo. Uh, to try to be put to death by the Moors, uh, but they were stopped, as uh, little kids often are, uh, by a sensible family member, I think it was an uncle, mm-hmm. uh, who found them and brought them back. And she continued, though, to love the, the lives of the saints, uh, but we're, what we see in these early years, the tension that plagued her for some time, and that was, on the one hand, she could see what she was being called to. She could see... The, the prayer life, the mystical life uh, that was there, but she was also held back 
by what she referred to as a worldliness, by an interest in material things, including uh, her her deep and, and abiding shame for what she thought was uh, an obsession with her own appearance. Her, so she, the, the sin of pride to her, uh, I, I think, was something that weighed very heavily on her. And so when she was sent to, to study with the Augustinian nuns at Avila, uh, she suffered deeply, uh, as is often the case with those who live in this kind of terrible tension. And to the point where she was in a, a, a coma, she spent years in abject misery, and yet emerged from this. Um, she was able to fight back uh, these weaknesses and felt that call uh, to enter the Carmelite monastery. Now, her father was not especially thrilled with the idea. And nevertheless, at the age of 20, she entered the Carmelite monastery, uh, the incarnation also in uh, Avila, and took the name Teresa of Jesus. But again, there was that tension. And she fell so ill that she was in a coma for four days, as she recounts, looking as though she were dead. And yet, again, she fought that weakness. But then, as she's in this cloister, as she's in this Carmelite, systematically, her family was lost to her. You know, her father died uh, in, in 1543, followed then by uh, her siblings, who, who either died or left for America, and this is a drama then of domestic loss combined with her own spiritual development. And it, it really culminates sort of in 1554 during Lent. Uh, here she was, she was 39 years old and discovered the statue of the Passion of our, of our Lord as she wrote, the grievously wounded, that helped to change her life around. And... Again, she felt that close connection to the confessions, and as she wrote uh, in her autobiography, feeling of the presence of God would come over me unexpectedly so that I could in no wise doubt either that he was within me or that I was wholly absorbed in him. And that inner reform of Teresa could not stay purely within her, as she always says, that those who receive blessings in, invariably must take those blessings that others might benefit from that. So what does she start? She begins the process of reforming the, the Carmel, the Carmelites in Avila. And she, in, in this task, she had the support of her bishop, uh, Don Alvaro de Mendoza, and as well as the support of the Order Superior General of the time, uh, Jean-Baptiste Rossi. I mention this because... The reform that she wanted to bring to the Carmelites so very much paralleled and mirrored the internal reform and the spiritual life that she was herself now undergoing. So it, it needed to have that external expression in that incarnational sense that we see with so many of the saints and so many of the doctors of the church. Again, I, I think that is so key that you see not only with those doctors of the church that have uh, received a subtitle, as it were, of mystical doctor. But you see it in almost, well, you actually see it in every life of not just the doctors of the church, but the fathers of the church, of the saints of holiness, uh -huh. that what is happening to them interiorly is manifested by the gift that's given to the church in the, their exterior expression. Yeah, it's it, because they understand deeply that it's not about them. And Teresa mm -hmm. saw around her uh, and was probably appalled by the, the laxity, the uh, lack of seriousness. Uh, and and it's, I don't mean to condemn the Carmelites of the time, but like so many great congregations and orders, reform is needed from time to time in the history of any community. And Teresa saw around her the need for that reform and exactly as she saw it in herself. And as a consequence of that, uh, she wanted to go back to the foundations, to be faithful to that original charism of the Carmel, 
the prayer life, the discipline, uh, the simplicity, that total commitment uh, to Christ. And as a result, she was given permission to begin establishing these new Carmelite communities. And of course, who did she meet along this way but St. John of the Cross? And of course, in, in 1568, uh, she established with him the first convent of what, what became known as the Discalced Carmelites, uh, not too far outside of Avila. And then came the permission to expand this community, uh, to have a more formal structure for it as, as a kind of autonomous province. We, we can date uh, from around 1580 then the starting point for the Discalced Carmelite order. What did she have to do, though? She, again, had to go through the process of validation, of study, of those who doubted the sincerity, the authenticity of this. And here we were just talking about the Inquisition. But Teresa and, and John of the Cross faithfully submitted themselves to this process. They didn't fight it. They didn't try to get around it. They didn't leave. They accepted the rightful authority of the church in making these decisions, and they were validated. And she gave her life to continuing to express the mystical life that she led, while at the same time pushing forward with the manifest expression of that reform in this new discalced Carmelite community, in this new order that, that she had helped bring about. And so she could die uh, on, on in October 15th of 1582, having just set up a new convent in Burgos, and what were her last words? I, I quoted part of it. She said, I die a child of the church, but then she added, O oh, my Lord and my spouse, the hour that I have longed for has come. It is time to meet one another. That itself, I think, tells us something about what she had always been hoping for, uh, and that is that final union with the one whom she had always known and, and with whom her relationship had deepened over the decades. And so she could die and enter his embrace. We, I go back to the incredible statue of Teresa of Avila by Bernini uh, in Rome. I know you've seen it, Chris. Uh, that moment of ecstasy, of prayer, culminated, I think, in that, in that one little sentence that she said, it is time to meet one another. It is a life that is so full and so rich with challenges, but also those great moments of triumph. And I mean triumph in the sense that it's a triumph of the interiority mm -hmm. for her, of that union. And we have so much more to talk about with this great doctor of the church. Uh, we've just touch the little tip of the iceberg, as it were. But any final thoughts on this particular reflection on this portion of her life? Yeah, uh, well, it's worth noting that she uh, uh, was beatified not too many years after her death in 1614. She was canonized in 1622. And then, as we noted, she was proclaimed a doctor of the church in 1970. Her entire life was spent in Spain. And yet the reforms that she brought uh, were for the universal church. And the spiritual writings that we're going to be focusing on in our next episode, I know, are for everyone, of every walk of life in every corner of the world. And that is one of the marks of a great saint and certainly one of the greatest of the doctors of the church. And we touched on the, her autobiography, which is so accessible to any reader at any time. I would highly encourage people just to even dive into that, wouldn't you, Matthew? Oh, I would definitely. Yeah. As a nice introduction to her other writings, especially the interior castle and other things that we're going to be talking about. Dr. Matthew Bunsen, thank you so much. Privileged to be with you. God bless. You've been listening to The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. To hear and or to download this conversation, Along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission 
And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen.